to his question, and I thought, well, it would be a good idea if I actually talked about this just very briefly uh, all together. Um, <coughs> it's all right, I do know where I am. I'm just uh, looking for something. Um, I'm in the MSC room, that's where I am. Yeah. Um, the thing is, uh, uh, it, you know, he said he's absolutely fascinated by the whole business of the cell, and so that's right, isn't it? And that's extremely understandable. Uh, and of course, I suppose what's happened a lot now is people have sort of marked that down, certainly as belonging to reductionistic biology, as you start to see things built up from the cells and so on. And which there was a phase when people thought that way, but um, they liked the idea of building blocks and so on. And they talked about cells as building blocks, which is a very false way of talking. Um, in fact, uh, people who are see people who are very keen on Goethe hate that kind of thing. Um, they think uh, falsely that it's wrong to look down microscopes. Uh, oh, that to look through telescopes or to use any instruments at all. Um, but there are these purists and they've had a very big impact. Um, and I, I, so, for example, what I do now, that kind of photograph and that, um, that I just showed, there are purist Goetheanists who are very, very annoyed if I show that picture because it's an electron micrograph and therefore it does not belong to Goethean science. And I mean, I have views of sometimes down people who say, but that is not needed, that is not necessary, that is not part of it. Notice it's a slight German accent. <laughs> German. And um, so, I mean, uh, this is a problem. And it's so prejudiced and so ignorant. Now, there was a book published in about 1910 by Rudolf Magnus on Goethe and science. It's the first book I ever saw donkeys years ago in the 1960s because uh, a friend of mine was always very keen on Goethe and science and he's the person who finally persuaded me to, to begin to look at it but that was a bit later it's not a brilliant book but um, it was written about 1908 or something and uh, he'd gone to Goethe's house and he wrote this book on Goethe as a scientist and he was totally non nothing to do with Rudolf Steiner or anything and he I didn't, uh, when I'd read it I hadn't even heard of Rudolf Steiner anyway and he, uh, he went to Goethe's house about that time, uh, in Weimar, and it was, he was shocked. It was filled with uh, scientific instruments, microscopes, tele um, not telescopes, all sorts of instruments, um, and, and uh, tremendous number of collections of bi biological specimens, geological specimens, huge number of geological specimens, but instruments everywhere, and especially with regard to optics. And this is what gave him a shock. Because although he was right to write this biography on Goethe and science, he started out with the assumption that Goethe was a dilettante. You know what that means, don't you? He's just an amateur. I mean, he just did it, dabbled in it. And when he saw all the instruments, he realized that Goethe was serious. Now, the point about this is that Goethe himself used instruments. But there are Goetheanists who say that that's entirely wrong to do that. And therefore, things like cellular biology because you only have access to it through microscopes, is something that you should not even consider. The level of prejudice and ignorance is appalling. Because, of course, you could perfectly well, and should, apply the Goethean approach to what you discover down the microscope. Um, which actually turns out, if you do it properly, to be very, very consistent indeed with what Goethe did. But there's a, there's a huge amount of work that could be done there. It could actually be presented in a more Goethean way. Uh, there's a huge amount of work that could be done. Now, the Goethean people aren't going to do it. There's a very good book by Wolfgang Schad, which I've recommended in the things I've written. Uh, it's on animal forms, and mammal forms, and it is brilliant. Uh, the book's been out of print forever. I got a copy in the early 1980s. It cost me a lot of money in those days. It was £10, which is a fortune. And... Uh, but the woman who made me buy it said, you need this book. And I, I, I said, I can't afford that. But I, I bought it. Um, and I'm glad I did. It took me a year to read it. And it's a brilliant book. Now, it turned out that in that book, there was a chapter on embryology. And when they translated it into English, they took it out. 
because that would not be of interest. Now, the man's a Goetheanist, but it's Wolfgang Schad, but they said that will not be of interest to English readers. They're not interested in embryology, because in this chapter, he refers to things which cannot be observed directly. So they took the chapter out. Now, it's a very fundamental chapter, because the threefold division that he actually finds in the mammals is actually there in the embryo. Uh, and was it ectoderm, mesoderm, and all that sort of business? It's all there. And actually, I can see where it relates to various things it does in the book. And if, in fact, they had kept that there, what well, I knew it's coming out again. I've, been, I, I've pushed for years and years to have this book redone. Uh, I won't take time up with this ridiculous behaviour of them. Oh, I think there was one publisher, and he's in England. And I was talking to him on the phone about this, because I was trying to get this republished. And I said, well, who's got the copyright to the book? He said, oh, I have. I bought the copyright to the book. I said, well, why don't you publish it? Uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what I think. I think there's too many diagrams in it. I mean, the whole po point of the thing is for all these diagrams, hand-drawn diagrams, that's the whole point of the thing. And I said, but that's the point of the thing. He said, don't you think there's rather too many? I, I, Ex-public school boy, I know the type. And he said, I said, no, I don't. And I said, mm. He said, well, think I should, you think I should republish it? He said, very expensive. He said, um, I tell you what. I, I think I, I could invite Shad for lunch. Do you think he'd like to go out for lunch? This is uh, this has nothing to do with it, of course. I, I'll invite Shad out for lunch when he comes to England next time. And this is the kind of pots you've got to go to to get a book published, you know. <laughs> and that's it. So it didn't work. But John Barnes is now doing a new translation. Uh, 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 Shad has actually updated it. And a new version is, as we speak, being prepared in, uh, in America... And the chapter on embryology is going in. And there will be a new edition. It will be very expensive. I've got a copy on my computer, if anyone wants what's to the read the electronic version. I can't remember. What, what's it called? I can't remember. I've got a copy of it. Well, you can't read it from the computer. Yeah, but it's, it's better than not having it at all. But you'd have to download it. Yeah, it's, I've got a downloaded version of every single page of the page. But it's very big. Yep. So I was just saying, same once to read it. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. See, yeah. I, I don't do downloads. Yeah. I don't do computers. That's mm -hmm. why. Uh, well, I do a bit. No, yeah, I don't. No, I don't. The, the file sizes are huge now, computers. Are they really? No, they're, they're just photographs. It's, it's not that big. Really? Okay. Wow. It's not big. Well, there's, a, there's something. I mean, one year I did actually do Shad here because Brian asked me to. <clears throat> I told my, my wife. It was a few days before I came down and he said, will you come and do Shad? I said, oh, God, I can't do that, Brian, it's impossible. And anyway, I agreed, I wrote some free. And uh, my wife said, you're mad. You can't possibly do that. There's no way you can do it. Well, I did it, but I just about killed myself and do it. We got to Wednesday and people said, well, when are you going to do something else? And I said, well, you asked me to do Shad. You have to, Shad is enormous detail. You can't do it without that. So, you know, you're asking me to do it and not do it. I said, no, do you want me to? And they said, no, can you go and do something else now? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's terrible. It, it's that kind of work you, to get into it. It's really, uh, really, you have to really put a lot of attention into it, don't you? And you have to go and look at these animals and so on. It will change your way of seeing things. It's a brilliant book. Anyway, the point was, they cut the chapter on embryology out because it won't be of interest to anyone who's interested in the Gertian way because that refers to things that can't be seen directly. <coughs> so this is the kind of prejudice there has been. In fact, all of these things can be understood in terms of Goethe's way of seeing and should well be. Things, of course, have moved on, and with regard to the cells and so on and that, uh, what you've now got, as I think you were mentioning, is you now have this stem cell research, which, of course, is exactly what we've just been talking about, where there are the stem cells, which are there before the specialised organs come. And the specialised organs then do come from the stem cells in different ways according to the circumstances. But, for example, you'd never see an already formed blood cell turn into a liver cell. But from the stem cell there may be blood cells, there may be liver cells and so on and that. So stem cell research is thoroughly and completely Gertianistic in this sense. But if you were to go... <coughs> to the Gertianists and say that, I think you'd find, you'd get quite a strong reaction from them. They'd actually say, some of them would say, this is exactly the sort of thing you should not be looking at. 
well, people like Craig wouldn't and so on, but I certainly have met people who would say that. Um, but stem cell research, and of course, people don't like talking about that because it's also controversial, because what they aim to do with it and so on and that. But the biological phenomenon is exactly what we've been talking about. And I expect several of you here already realised that before I said this, didn't you? You did. No, I, I, um, I, I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, yeah. When it is, it is. I, I, yeah, it is. <clears throat> I put a note in the book because my wife said you've got to do that, and I said, Oh God, I don't want to do that because I'll, I'll get so angry, and all people say, Oh, this is immoral and so on, because all all the stuff they want to do with it and so on. She said, Yeah, but biologically, this is it. This is Goethe. So she might. So I put a footnote in. You see. So that was it. Stem cells sort of hold the organising idea? Well, you, you couldn't really call it an organising idea, could you? Because that's, uh, well, some people might want to say, say that, but I mean, I don't think I'd really like to. It's something like that, isn't it? Yes, and it holds the organising Let's call it something like that. <coughs> not idea, but yeah. Um, yeah. See, our problem is it's very difficult for us to know exactly how to think of these things. Mm -hmm. That's our problem. In language. Yeah. Um, I want to just mention here, having got this far before I, I go on, because uh, we've got the protein thing now, we've got this. We've got to go further in depth into this, and then again, further in depth again. We've got two further steps to go in depth into this. Um, but before I do that, I just want to mention, um, it's not terribly relevant, but it's interesting, I am. Um, <sighs> Goethe himself said about himself that he had no organ for philosophy. He was not able to deal with philosophy at all. But <clears throat> um, this is, of course, of great value. It's because he had no organ for, for philosophy that he never, as it were, philosophized what he was doing. He did it directly, concretely. Mm -hmm. That is what his gift, his genius was. Many people have some sort of ability in philosophy, and uh, they can quite easily uh, philosophize away and so on and that. But very few people have the gift of working in Goethe's way. Margaret Cahoon has that gift. So you're very lucky, actually, to be getting her. She has the ability to work in Goethe's way. Um, and you'll find that out. You're very good in that respect. But Goethe himself found it almost impossible to reflect on what he was doing and to describe what he was doing. He could do it, but he found it almost impossible to describe what he was doing. Hegel was very keen on what Goethe did. But so far as can be told, Goethe couldn't understand a word Hegel said. Uh, but that was not uncommon. Almost nobody could understand the word Hegel said. <laughs> and the reason is that it now turns out that Hegel formed his concepts very early in life. And they went through a phase of development. And then he started using those concepts as they were in the finished form directly with people in his lectures and they couldn't understand and he couldn't understand why they couldn't understand which since he was a very dynamic thing himself is very strange he didn't actually go into the evolution of the concepts and thus it has remained to this day so that was that but Hegel said of Goethe he does concretely what I, Hegel, do abstractly he understood but th there was a much more fruitful relationship between Hegel and Schelling. No, damn. Between uh, Goethe and Schelling. Schelling was a lot younger than Goethe. I mean, Schelling was in his early 20s, and he was uh, like a, um, a supernova burst. And like supernova do, then, then faded. Um, it's not good to be a supernova and this kind of thing. Um, but he was the great shining light. And Goethe actually used to go and talk to him and uh, he, he got somewhere with Schelling, and he felt that in his conversations with Schelling in Weimar, in uh, Jena, that he came to understand what it was that he himself was doing. 
And it's now with this from Schelling that he understood that what he was doing was what we've been talking about. He was going into the coming into being of things, following the coming into being, instead of beginning with the finished products. He couldn't articulate that himself. He could do it concretely, but he couldn't articulate it. He could do later, gradually, he learned how to do this. Uh, later on in life, he was better at this, but to begin with, he really couldn't, couldn't, couldn't manage this at all. And there's some very interesting comments that um, Schelling has, which reflects very much, and this is why I'm doing this, uh, what um, Goethe's approach. Because Schelling emphasized that to understand nature, as he put it, we must rise from nature as fact to nature as the action itself in its acting. Well, it's perfect, isn't it? Nature as fact, finished. To the action itself in its acting, the coming into being. And that was what, what that was, uh, I think that's quite a, a very, very good, uh, there are other things as well. But that idea of rising from nature as fact to nature as the action itself in its acting, catching it in the act. Well, we're back to catching seeing in the act, catching distinguishing in the act, and so on. But now we're catching nature in the act. What we're doing here is exactly what we've been doing in the phenomenology. But here we're doing it with, with, with nature, with life, in nature, organic life, rather than with our own inward, more inward experience. And you see already how much easier it is to do. Um, <coughs> this, um, <coughs> the difference, <coughs> they, uh, they, they talk about the difference, I think Goethe talks about, and Schelling does, the difference between nature as productivity and nature as product. And this is often described in terms, hey, what, all right, nature as productivity instead of nature as product. And this is often described in terms of two Latin terms. Um, natura naturans and natura naturata. Now, natura naturans can be translated as nature <coughs> naturing. And natura naturata Nature, natured. It's as simple as that. Productivity, product. But this distinction, natura naturans, natura naturata, which is usually just left in Latin, but I've translated it because I think it brings out better, is usually, as the idea of nature, um, it's sort of attributed to Spinoza, the philosopher Spinoza, who certainly does use this. And Schelling and Goethe and all those people at that time in that group were pretty much steeped in Spinoza. Without an organ for philosophy, Goethe tried to read Spinoza. Um, and it generally said in many books that this comes originally from Spinoza, but it doesn't. Uh, Spinoza, again, is the person you'd have to see in context of who he was, where he was, what his circumstances were, what, what the background was. But this, this, this notion of the difference between nature and naturing, and these very words, natura naturans, natura naturata, they go back and they're found in the earlier Renaissance nature philosophy in Italy and so on and that. Uh, and before that, they go back to a person who people have got very interested in now, to the 10th century, a man called Scotus Eriogena, who you may have heard of, or not heard of. Um, he's one of these uh, wonders. In the time of the Carolingian Renaissance in Northern Europe, in the middle of the, uh, what, in, what, what used to misleadingly be called the Dark Ages, which were actually filled with light, but never mind, um, there, there is this man who, who towers above everyone else by producing this, ex this extraordinary work on the divisions of nature, Scottish Erigina, and it, it uh, just sort of stands out as a remarkable piece of work. And many later people were very much influenced by him. People are very interested in him today. Um, and he introduced this distinction between these two. So it goes back a long, long way. Um, and the reason why I mention that is because, again, it gives you some feeling, perhaps, that what we're doing here, with working with Goethe, 
is actually really part of a very long tradition. It's not something that's just new or was even new with Goethe. And each stage in the tradition, new developments are made. It's formulated in new ways, better ways, more developed, and it grows and it grows and it grows. Because what people don't get the idea of is that the tradition is a living thing. People think of tradition as a dead weight of the past, and it can be. But what tradition really is, is a living, growing thing. And therefore, in doing this work, we're actually part of a living tradition which is growing, and it has its roots a long way back. So that I find, personally, extremely interesting. We are not on our own. We're not Modern people, we all tend to think that uh, what we do is done for the first time. And this isn't true. Uh, funny if it, People don't understand this idea of a living tradition. The one person who does is Prince Charles. It might be the only thing he does understand, but uh, <laughs> he does understand this difference. Unfortunately, he, th he gets it wrong because <coughs> he builds these houses which are absolutely awful. Um, <laughs> I shut up. <laughs> Have you seen Poundbury? God, a nightmare. Um, anyway, so we won't get to Prince Charles, but he does... He talks about this anyway. Right. Is it me or is it hot? Maybe you can open the Right, now we're going to go deeper into this and we come to a difficult bit. Um, I want to introduce you to the extraordinary idea of self-differencing. Self-difference instead of self-sameness. Because it, this is the one and the same organ. If one and the same organ, and the key thing is always you've got to say to yourself, one and the same organ presents itself to us in different forms, different organs, then each organ is that organ differently. It's not another organ. That's the key thing. Because we would think that here's one organ, here's another organ, here's another organ, but it isn't. There's only one organ presenting itself differently. Therefore, each organ is that one organ. It's always one and the very same organ differently, not another organ. Proteus is always one and the same Proteus differently. It's not another Proteus. If Proteus crops up in one form somewhere and another form somewhere else, you don't say, oh, that's another Proteus. It's actually a Proteus in another form. But it's not another Proteus. It's always the very same and not another one. And yet, it's always becoming different from itself. One way of putting it I searched for formulations of this for a long time, but you can say it becomes other without becoming another. So what you get is it produces the other of itself, but not another one. It's the other of itself, not another one. So Goethe's one and the same organ manifesting as different forms is a self-differencing organ producing differences of itself. Could, could we say that in, in terms of the whole and the parts? Yes, we could. The parts are yeah. the whole different. different yeah, yeah. But 
That's exactly right. You've got it. We can do all of this in terms of the, of the whole and the part. Um, in fact, um, in this, well, because I'm concerned with the one and the many, I don't do that. I think I mentioned it right at the end. And it, I wonder sometimes whether I should have done it in terms of the whole and the part. But you're exactly right. That the part is, um, the whole comes to presence in the part. And therefore the part itself is a reflection of the whole or a presencing of the whole. It's exactly like that, yes. That's what you were thinking, wasn't it? Mm. Yes. It is exactly that. But because Goethe talks about one, and this is the idea of the one and the many, I've done it in terms of that language rather than the whole and the part. But everything I'm saying can be translated into that, into that language as well. <clears throat> so when you see different organs, we say, look, there are different organs. There are actually self-differences of one organ. They are actually different in the sense in which we see them. They are different, but they're self-differences. So they're not separate. Though you would see these organs perhaps as separate, you could even separate them. It's an extraordinary idea, self-difference instead of self-sameness. Because what you've got here, down here, the unity of the physical organs, what they have in common, that's self-sameness. What you've got up there is self-difference, or rather self-differencing, I prefer to think of it in terms of now. So when you go upstream into the coming into being, we discover the self-differencing organ, which appears downstream as several different organs. And we then lose the wholeness. <clears throat> the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, you probably haven't heard of him, but there's been a, he's dead, about 1990 I think, there's been a huge amount of interest in him in recent years, in England of all places. Um, <clears throat> he's difficult. But he was very much concerned with Bergson, with Spinoza and Nietzsche, and developed his whole philosophy, which is very difficult to follow. Um, but it's very dynamic and very alive. And I found that the Deleuzeans and the Bergsonians were very interested in this work because they said, well, this is just exactly what Deleuze is doing and so on and that. So that's nice. And in one of his books, I was a phrase here which I like. He said, there is other without there being several. And I like that. Well, in this case, with the self-differencing organ, there is other without there being several. It's as if it goes towards something and then holds it back. Because we would say, well, there's another and there's another and there's another. No, there isn't. There's something that's other, and they're all other, but they're all others of the very same one. There are several. There are not several organs. There's only one organ. So you have... Um, other without there being several. So in fact, because this is the dynamical unity of self-differencing, what this means is that difference is intrinsic to unity. Difference is within unity. Astonishing, because up until now, we have thought that the way to find unity was to remove the differences to find what things have in common. Now we find there's a dynamical unity which has got difference within it. Indeed, it is the unity of self-differencing. And I have to say, the self-differencing is the unity and the unity is the self-differencing. There's no separation. If you find a separation, it's because your thinking is downstream. It's as simple as that. You've got to go upstream a bit and then you'll see there's no separation. Unity is self-differencing. Self-differencing is unity here. Very different indeed from the static unity of self-sameness, which excludes all difference. It's an astonishing thing. And here... I would say upstream you have the self-differencing organ. Downstream 
different organs, many different organs. But upstream is the self-differencing organ. <clears throat> distinction is here, but distinction without any separation. That's the key thing. And I'm going to talk about what on earth that could be like in a moment. just want to pick up on one thing. In English, the word being is what's called a participle. Well, it's a noun and a verb. And so it's ambiguous. And that gives us a degree of freedom. Because usually we use it as a noun. Um, we talk about a being as an entity. In fact, in that respect, the word being is simply an abstract term. It's sort of, it's, it's a term for something without taking any regard for what it is that distinguishes itself, distinguishes it from anything else. So you could think of a, for example, um, it doesn't refer to any specific characteristics, which makes it one particular kind of thing or another. So a table is a being, so is a rock, so is a fish, so is a plant. Anything is a being. It's the ultimate abstract generalization. And it seems so empty of content that to say of something that it is a being is to say no more than it exists as a thing. Because you haven't specified it at all. So it's, it seems to be, it's always been taken to be uh, a, a concept which, which is the most abstract, it's the abstraction of the abstraction. The soup of the soup. Uh, therefore, it's very dilute and very thin. And to say of something that a, it is a being is to say no more than that where it exists. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell you very much. Um, but of course, that has changed. Because also, in English, the word being is verbal. Being. And that's the way in which I am using it, of course. And in that sense, being is intrinsically dynamic and often I hyphenate it to make sure people know how to read it be hyphen in being what we have here is the plant being itself think of it as a doing thing dynamically and, uh, and that is why There is no difference here between being and becoming, which is interesting because it's also so in ancient Greek philosophy that coming into being is being, being. There only is a difference when you start with the static notion of being as a noun. Then that has to become. So there's a difference in being and becoming. But when being is dynamic, the being is the becoming. So being is coming into being, the same thing. So there's no, no difference between being and becoming, which is one of the things that happens in philosophy and God knows what, which causes so much trouble. So it just disappears. It's not there. It's because it, people thought of being in a static kind of way. <clears throat> what that means is, therefore, there is movement in being. This is heresy, as we'll see later. This is, so far as the Western philosophical tradition is concerned, a completely heretical statement. But this is, in fact, what has happened since the time of Hegel. When, and it takes off in spades, in bucketfuls in 20th century philosophy, that being is intrinsically dynamic. We've simply been thinking about it in a very restricted way. And if you look at Goethe's work, then you can see this there in front of your eyes in the organic world. And we'll come <coughs> across this more and more as we go along. <coughs> so the idea of a self-differencing organ <clears throat> where you have distinction without separation, is, to me, something extraordinary. <clears throat> uh, you catch it a bit, but you have to live with this quite a lot. And so it grows in you. And when it grows in you, you begin to realise, it's rather like going back to Kepler's third law, how marvellous it must have been for the people then. You get the same kind of feeling with this when you really get into it and let it grow in you, you encourage it, you will come to think, "Cut this is just miraculous. And also, you realise, but this is right there in front of us, and it's the complete opposite to the way everyone thinks. Then you realise, it's this kind of thinking which is needed. 
in a world which is an intrinsically dynamic world. Not the other kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Mind you, circumstances change. <clears throat> if we just lived through the Thirty Years' War, we wouldn't be interested in differences. We'd really want to know what's the same. So it's, you know. Right, now I've got to introduce something else, because I've kept going on about this is a distinction with no separation. When you fall downstream, you see it as separation. But within the coming into being, the self-differencing organ, there is clearly distinction, difference, but there is no separation. And I mean, each organ is, of course, when I say distinction, each one is difference-related. It's obvious they're related. I'm not, you, I'm not bringing the word relate in. But each, when I say distinction, it's a difference-relating, isn't it? Self-differencing is self-relating. It's obvious, isn't it? I, actually, it's all right me sitting here saying that's obvious. I wonder if I should, in fact, have emphasised that. Obviously, self-differencing is self-relating. I, um, I, I, I suddenly realised I, I haven't, I haven't emphasised that point at all in the writing of this, this stuff. I wonder if I've made a mistake by not drawing attention to that. Hmm. That self-differencing must be self-relating. And therefore, again, you have this distinction which is difference-relation. Mm -hmm. oh, I was thinking that um, self-differencing opens the opportunity for self-relating. Yes. Because a lot of times people just mm -hmm. being stuck at the point that when they do the separation. Yes, that's right. Um, I haven't got a pen. Can someone let me something to write with? Just a second. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Sorry about that, but I must write the note that myself there. Just in the diagram there, it went from distincting, distinction, instead of forcing it into unity, but moved it towards seeing that in terms of relating, then it would be a third movement in that that wouldn't be as falsely abstracting it into something that it's not. Yes, possibly, yes. But I mean, I, yes, it, it could well be. I mean, there are things you can do with this. Um, it's not as useless as I, I make it out to be. But it's obviously I've got to emphasize here the difference between them. Okay, so we're talking about distinction. And now I want to introduce something else. We've got to learn to think dynamically. And now also we've got to learn to think intensively instead of extensively. We need to keep those two terms together, intensive extensive. Because if we don't, people go wrong, very understandably, because of the language. And they think intensive means like intense, intensely. And it doesn't mean that at all. We'll see what it means. So, the thing is that um, there are, most of the distinction, we, well, there's kind of distinctions we've dealt with so far are extensive distinctions. One thing is distinct from another, though related. Here we've got self-difference. So we have this peculiar thing that something is distinct from itself and yet the same as itself. And that is a distinction, but it's an intensive distinction, not an extensive distinction. These words, which will not be easy for you to begin with, uh, I, I came across this kind of thing in mathematics. And the words were introduced into mathematics quite early on, and they come from uh, medieval philosophy. Um, so they have a background, but I'm using them in a very specific way. 
And now I'm going to try to... Uh, I can make it easy, easier for you uh, and for myself <coughs> by uh, finding examples. An extensive distinction, one thing is different from another thing. An intensive distinction, something is different from itself. Now what we need is something to help us here. What Bohm used to call templates for thinking. We need a template for our thinking, for intensive thinking to form round. <clears throat> and a very, very good one is provided in the first instance by the hologram with which you're all immensely familiar. <clears throat> and as you know, um, with a hologram, it has a peculiar property. Well, this property is one which you won't find in the holograms you will buy now. So don't try it. You'll get very cross with me. Um, but going back to the 1960s when holograms were first produced, they were not mass produced. And they were produced on a plate. It would, you wouldn't use photographic paper. You used a, a photographic plate, a glass plate with photographic emulsion on it. And the, this was done with the light of a laser, and you want to illuminate a scene of some kind. Uh, you have to illuminate it with the light of a laser in various ways. And this then forms a, a, a peculiar pattern on the plate, which you can't see anything in it. It's, you say it's sort of squiggles and this sort of business, nothing. But if you then illuminate that plate with the light, the same kind of laser light, same wavelength and so on and that, then what you find in front of you, as if you're looking through a window at it, is uh, what appears to be a full three-dimensional optical reconstruction of the original scene. It's uh, uncanny. I don't know if they still have these now. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, well, in the 60s and 70s, there were exhibitions, there were a big exhibition went round, and some of these plates were absolutely gigantic. And it was just as if the optical appearance of something had been lifted off it like a skin and was hanging there in space in full three-dimensionality just on the other side of this glass screen as if you were looking at it through a window. It was uncanny. And I remember one of them, which greatly impressed me, because it was of a horse galloping towards me. And I, I jumped out of the way. <laughs> this horse was galloping towards me. So my body did it. Uh, and it's amazing. Uh, well, now it's all different. And they're done by different means and so on. Um, so we're all blasé about it now anyway, but there you are. Well, what fascinated people at the time was this remarkable property of holograms that you could divide a hologram uh, materially but you can't divide uh, the, it's called an optical reconstruction rather than just calling it an image a photographic image with a holog holographic optical reconstruction you can't divide the optical reconstruction what that means is let's supposing that um, Reba said to me have I pronounced it right? said to me, uh, I've got a hologram of this galloping horse. And she says, I really like that. Uh, can you tell me where I can get one? It's got a big screen. And I said, no worries, Reba, but it's okay. No worries, mate, it's okay. <laughs> 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 uh, it's okay. Uh, I, I'll give you one. And I start to cut the glass in two. Stop, stop, she says, you'll ruin it. I cut it in two and say, here you are, here's yours. You fool, she says. Now I've only got half a horse. And you've only got half a horse, but no. When we look through it, we've each got the same whole horse. So you can divide the whole, and it remains whole. It turns out that although it's materially divisible, it's optically indivisible. So you have, she has a horse, I have a horse. And everyone wants to get in on the act then, so we start dividing these plates up, and we all end up with whole horses. It's just that it gets smaller. It's like looking through a smaller window. Um, now, they said, when this first started out, and I think in the original paper I wrote, the bit on the whole counterfeiting holes, I actually said this, 
that as you divide it into more and more bits, it gets more and more fuzzy, it breaks down a bit. But actually I found that if I did this by covering over with a mask, it should have had the same effect. But it didn't, it's remarkably good. Well, you can't do this with the ones now because they're reflection holograms and they're produced in a different way. So if you get a hologram now and you cut it in half, you'll be very disappointed because you really <laughs> it won't work. Now, that's an example of an intensive division. Because if we say to ourselves, uh, when we've done that, OK, uh, Reva's got one and I've got one. How many are there? Well, the obvious answer is there's two. But how can there be two? Because each is the very same one. So there's one. And each optically, each is the very same one. So there's one. But there isn't one, because if there was one, that would be the same as it was before we divided. Divided it. So there isn't one, and there isn't two. So what we have here is what I call an intensive division, which produces, in this case, a multiplicity in unity, each of which is the same one. And you can see this point by now supposing that it was a photograph. Supposing, instead of this hologram plate, we have a photograph of a galloping horse. And what do I do? I divide the photograph in half. Let's supposing it's a photographic plate, as used to be in photography in the old days. Not a piece of paper, but a plate. And this is a negative image of a horse. I, divide, I give half to Reba and half to me. Now, she's quite right to call me a fool because she's got half a horse. I've got half a horse and it's no good to either of us. So how can we get a whole horse with a, with, with a photograph? We have to produce a pho another photograph. We have to make a copy. Now, I can make a copy by using the plate and making several copies from one plate or I can make a copy and go to the Xerox machine and make a copy. But either way, I'm making a copy. And now there are two, quite clearly there are two, in a way in which you can see there are not two with the hologram. If you compare, think about doing it. I would say if you think about doing this, think about copying it, think about dividing the hologram, you will see from the actions that the outcome is completely different. Because in one case you divide the whole and it remains whole. So there's still one, but it's one in the form of two. Yet it's not two of one which is what you would have if you made a photocopy. Working with this kind of um, this kind of example I found to be extremely useful in getting myself to be able to see what was the difference between an extensive and an intensive distinction. The copies of the photograph are it's an extensive distinction. The hologram, this is an intensive distinction. And this is pretty important uh, to get this because the self-differencing organ, that is an intensive distinction. But there are many other possible templates that one can look at here. Um, vegetative reproduction is another one where we move from, from light to life and you know that a plant uh, the one I always give is the fuchsia plant and uh, it doesn't matter if you don't know what a fuchsia plant is but some of you will do you know you have here yeah, fuchsia plant and uh, it is said that if you take a leaf of a fuchsia plant and you divide it up into two or three pieces and you plant each piece separately in different pots and you have the right nutrients and you look after it and so on each of those bits of relief will grow into a few full future plant I say it is said because my wife says she doesn't believe it and she gardens, she says she doesn't believe this works but I read it in a book it must be true <laughs> um, anyway it, it, it's a good example really um, you, you, you could do this get a few pots of these plants. Um, people could say, oh, I like those plants. Say, here, have one. Oh, I like them. Oh, here, have one. Uh, you say, well, I'm going off to London. That's right, take your plant to London. It's all right. But how many plants are there? The answer is there's one. There's only one plant. 
intensively is a multiplicity in unity. See, in, you can divide unity. If you try to divide unity extensively, you fragment it. But you can, therefore, have a division in unity which is intensive because it doesn't fragment it. The reason is because when you divided it, each one is the same one which it was originally. You have to picture this. If you build this in imagination, you can see this and you can see the difference. Because where you would see many plants, there's one, there's another one, there's another one. No, there's one and there's the other of the one and there's the other of the one. These are not several plants. They're all the other of each other. That's not another. They're not another. They're not several plants. But we see several plants. Because we, we see downstream. Because we see it materially, physically. Not organically. Our seeing isn't according to the organic, just as our seeing isn't according to the light. It's according to the material factor only. What Bergson called the logic of solid bodies. He said, our thinking is the logic of solid bodies. He's got a lot of stuff on this, and it's good stuff. It uh, really is. Um, but I'm just not bringing Bergson. I'm not using Bergson, but in the past, I did it quite a bit. And I love the phrase, the logic of solids. Well, he calls it the logic of solids, actually. I put the word body in. He calls it the logic of solids. And he says, our thinking is the logic of solids. And it is. So when you come to self-difference, you're no longer thinking the logic of solids. Uh, when you come to intensive distinction like this, you're no longer in the logic of solids because this can't be done in the logic of solids. So here we have a kind of multiplicity which is a non-numerical multiplicity. If you look at the plants as many ones, one another, there's many ones, that's numerical. But when you see it as multiplicity in unity, that's non-numerical. In fact, it's before the numerical. Because when you fall downstream from multiplicity in unity, you fall into many ones. So you fall from the non-numerical into the numerical. Uh, I used to down to talk about multiplicity in unity being pre-numerical for that reason. Uh, and I, I don't know why, but I've stopped doing that. I didn't want to focus people on, on this numerical side of things. Funnily enough, at this conference I went to on creative evolution where I talked to Mr. Deleuze, and Brian was there. There was a man there who gave a brilliant paper, and Brian knew him, um, in which he used Bergson with regard to human communities. And Bergson was talking about exactly this kind of non-numerical multiplicity and how in order to resolve a situation that occurred, and this is at Foy in Cornwall, where there was a disastrous housing estate, which was dreadful, they had managed to, as he put it, he'd been working on this, uh, heal it by turning what was a numerical multiplicity back in a numeric fragmented situation, back into a non-numerical multiplicity in which everything, everyone was related. And this sounds terribly abstract, but this man had done this in practice, and he described this in terms of Bergson's philosophy. And of course, it's fitted perfectly with, with Goethe. And I said to him, I should get this man to talk in. He said, I've tried and tried, but the man's so busy, he, we can't get him to come. I've forgotten his name now. I didn't remember it. Do you know him? No. I didn't remember this until I was coming down here. I'll look it up. Uh, it was just fabulous. And so this business about going from a, nu from a numerical multiplicity to a non-numerical one, which is before the separation of the many ones, it sounds so abstract. Well, here you can see it's actually concrete in the plant. But this man coming at it from an entirely different direction through Bergson have found that this illuminated a process of social change and social reclamation, which is astonishing. That's really the kind of thing that is a bit of a turn on. But I can't find anything is written on it, so there we are. Anyway, there we are. So, you see, extensively, we can have either one or many. You've either got one or you've got many. Intensively, we can have it both ways. Intensively, we can have one and many at the same time. Because the one is many. 
The when one of the parts, yes, I don't want to get muddled up. I don't want to, don't do too much either. Um, when you get a multiplicity in unity, what I've actually said is, you've got here one. I've just said yes. You've got the ordinary one, where you have many ones, and then you have one or many. Here it's different. You have a one which is many. And so I've called that an intensive dimension of one. And when I write this, I give it a capital O to distinguish from a small o when it's just a numerical one. So when you do the future plant and you produce this multiplicity in unity of one and the same plant, then you're producing an intensive dimension of one. It's as if one is a dimension within itself when you see this intensively. And the word dimension is interesting because originally it was used, funnily enough, the word dimension, we talk about three dimensions and so on and that, but originally uh, it was very much associated with the notion in, in thermodynamics it was associated with the notion of a degree of freedom. You know this. Yeah. A degree of freedom. What this means is, if you have a, an extra dimension, you have an extra degree of freedom. That means you don't have lots of new things, but you can do things with what you've got that you can't do otherwise. So here, this, is, uh, this intensive dimension of one gives us an extra degree of freedom. Because we can do things here or see things here which you can't do when you're limited to the logic of solids, the bodily world. Where it's either one or it's many. Here, it's one and many at the very same time. The one is the many, the many is the one. Therefore, this is a different degree of freedom that you have in this case. And that's really why I talk about the intensive dimension of one. It's an extra degree of freedom. And that maybe a bit too much for you so let's have another example the strawberry plant we all like strawberries mm. I suppose we do uh, this is very good because um, what you've got let's take a strawberry bed in the garden I've got one at home we get strawberries in the summer and that's nice you've got a bed of strawberry plants now it looks when you look at it like there's lots of strawberry plants. But of course there isn't, there's only one plant. Because it puts out runners, and the root goes down, and then another plant grows up. But it's actually the very same plant. This is again this reproduction process. It's, it's actually producing self-differences of itself. or multi It's producing, the strawberry bed that you look at is actually a multiplicity in unity. It looks like many separate plants just many ones. It isn't. It's a multiplicity in unity. It actually, when you look at a strawberry bed, you're looking straight at the intensive dimension of one. But you'd never, of course, think of that. But you can try this now. And what's more, the other thing is, you can switch from one way of seeing to the other, like the Gestalt switch. The reversing cube. You can see many ones, separately, extensively, switch in intensive dimension of one, multiplicity and unity. Switch extensive dimension of many ones, all different separateness and so on. Switch, same thing, multiplicity and unity, intensive dimension of one. You can look at that same situation and you can see it both ways. What you're doing is you're going you're downstream, upstream, downstream, upstream. You can do that for yourself. And what I recommend is practicing this. You don't actually have to go and see a strawberry bed. If you've got one available, it's the best thing to do. But you can do this in imagination. You can, you can create this for yourself. You can think this through in your own imagination. and Do it in imagination. Do the switching in imagination. And all these examples I've just done now, you can imagine it. 
You should sit and imagine yourself dividing a hologram and seeing this. And then imagine yourself producing a, 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 a copy of a photograph or Xeroxing. Imagine the fuchsia plant and then this strawberry bed. And if you do this for yourself, I know people say, I don't need to do that, it's so simple. But it builds something. See, the intellectual mind wants to rush ahead. It, it, so I heard that, now I've done that, now you've done, what's next, what's next? Could be a total about what's next? That's the intellectual mind. But, and it, it tells you, oh, it's all right, I understand that. And it hasn't, hasn't understood it at all because it's got a mere abstraction of it. But what you can do is make things real by using the imaginative mind. Not imaginatively in the sense of, wow, let's fantasize. Uh, no, this is what I'm really doing here, what Goethe called exacta syndical fantasy, and Margaret will be talking about this. As part of the Goethean method is to actually take what you've observed and then to build it again in imagination as exactly as you can. So we can use it. It used to be called, I mean, I was introduced to this years and years and years ago, long before I'd ever heard of Goethe. It was just called visualization. Uh, and now it's come back again, hasn't it? People have got keen on this. But when you visualize, a lot of this stuff is you visualize you're going on a journey. And that, no, you're not doing that. This is the exact sensorial imagination. You've got to do it as exactly as you can in imagination. Oh, that's boring, isn't it? My imagination wants to introduce uh, wonderful fantasies and so on. If you do that, you're lost in this. It's a special way of working with imagination. And it, it builds something, and it takes you more deeply into the phenomenon, because you actually internalize it, and say it actually grows in you, and it, you get this. Then you, can st you will start to see this. You will, this will happen. Uh, this stuff I worked on for years. It came in different forms. Years and years. And um, first of all, I wasn't doing this with, with, with Goethe at all. I was doing it with something else. Um, but it was later I realized this was Goethe. And uh, when I was working with this in the 70s, I, it used to come over me, oh, and later too, um, I... I could be somewhere, just doing the washing up, or walking down the street, and suddenly, it was as if someone had taken my head off and put another head on. <laughs> and I was seeing in this way. And it could happen with nothing. And then it had gone. Uh, no control over it. And this happened to me quite a lot. But it's because I was working on it quite... Thin. When you see it, oh, this is real. You know what you're seeing is real. And then it's gone. And you know when it's gone, because you find yourself trying to remember it. Mm -hmm. The moment you try to make trying to remember, you know it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, you can do this. Now, I want one other thing, example I want to bring up, because I do think you'll quite like this one. Oh, uh, yeah, the strawberry bed, obviously, there you've got, what did I say, <coughs> instead of many separate plants, you've got, there is other, without being several, you can see that in the strawberry bed, Forget that, other without being several. Now, the potato. The potato. Here we are. Ah, I'm going to quote from a book by John Seymour called The Countryside Explained. Um, when I found my settling with the country, uh, you don't know the film Withnell and I, do you? and I? Yeah. Yeah. There's a marvellous line where he says, We've come into the country by accident, by mistake. You know, we've come into the country by mistake. Well, that happened to me. I went into the country by mistake and I'm still living there. So that's it. So, uh, when, I, when I found myself living in the country, I thought, I don't know about it. I better get a book. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a book by John Seymour called The Country Explained. I thought, that's for me. And he was explaining to me. Uh, in this book, it's a lovely concept, isn't it? In this book, he talks, this is, I'm going to quote, it's really good. The potato is not grown commercially from seed, but from sets, which are just potatoes. And so, and so, all the potatoes of one variety in the world are one plant. They are one individual that has just been divided and divided. When you produce a new variety, you have to first of all fertilize a plant with the pollen of another one. But when you've got your new variety, after that, quote, 
the breeder arranges for the new variety to be multiplied by setting the actual potatoes from it. And if it proved as a popular variety, the original half dozen or so potatoes on the first ever plant of that variety may turn, by division and subdivision, into billions and billions of potatoes. All actually parts of that first plant. It would be interesting to know how many billion tons that first King Edward potato plant has developed into in its life. So the King Edward potato is one plant through space and time. So this is interesting. If you buy King Edward potatoes and you have people around for dinner and you're eating potatoes, you can say to them, do you realise the potato you're putting in your mouth is identically the same, is, is the very same as the potato I'm putting in my mouth. It's the very same potato. I don't think I said that very well, but anyway. Uh, anyway, never mind. Um, it's, it's not the best dinner party conversation to have. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. Uh, each potato is the one potato. There's only one potato. So the kick of a potato plant is a gigantic multiplicity in unity. It's a huge intensive dimension of one. It's intensive. But what we see when we go to Sainsbury's or Morrison's or wherever we go to buy our potatoes is lots and lots and lots of many potatoes. That's what we see. Because naturally we see it in the downstream way. We see it extensively. But when we buy it intensively it is one potato. That's astonishing stuff this. So what you've got really, is one plus being itself multiply. Being itself multiply. You don't have many plants. But we, of course, don't see it that way. We see many plants. Each of them is another one. It's a separate potato, and so on. And again, you switch this. You can do this with this, you switch it. It's, you can see this, and this comes up again and again and again. Uh, well, in this case, one plant being itself multiply without becoming many. Organically, the plant doesn't become many, but we see it many because we see it like in the logic of solids, this external thing. Okay? So one being itself multiply without becoming many. The plant doesn't become many. We see many but it doesn't become many. And that's a useful formulation, because this comes up time and time again in the work I've been doing. There's one being itself multiply, what, what seems to us like many different ones. And you make this switch upstream. And that's very, very important. I don't know whether I'll get to this, or I'll try to indicate a bit tomorrow, because I don't want to do too much with you. Um, but I will try to indicate how valuable this is in, in connection with with understanding meaning of of of, um, of, of, of written text, or it's called hermeneutics, the, the various interpretations of a work and so on and that, and we can see this. It's quite remarkable. This whole way of thinking just transforms um, the way we understand, you know, because with any particular work there are many interpretations of it. You know that kind of thing, and that whole business. Then there's a question about how can, well, how can you know what's, what's the real right one, if any one of them is, and so on and that. And when you, tr when you transform it into this way of thinking, you get a completely different understanding. It's what I would call organic hermeneutics. And I can't call it that, because if I do, people will think I'm talking about the organic world being looked at in that way, and it's the hermeneutics of the organic, I'm not. So I call it the, the philosophy of unfinished meaning, but... Uh, We'll talk about that briefly tomorrow. And everything I'm saying now about the plant can be transposed into this world of the meaning of, of works, the meaning of the work of art, the meaning of text, the experience of art, and so on and that, and the many different ways it can be experienced. And what is the relation between those different ways and the original work? This, this kind of thinking transforms all of that and opens up a whole new dimension for us to explore and understand and many of the problems that people have had about this just disappear. So that, that's, one of, that's my major application of this. I'm actually doing Goethean thinking in, in hermeneutics, 
which is where no one would expect anyone to do it. Uh, fair enough. Okay. There's another side to story. It actually brings together the phenomenology and this one of the many from Goethe, the two streams that we look at, they come together. I just mentioned this now because I want you to realise that the, once you've got this way of thinking, the, the, the applicability of it, the applicability of it is, the potential is terrific. And that's what happens, and that's what you will find in your own way when you're, during this year, ways in which this kind of, because that's happened before, isn't it, mm. with students, ways in which this kind of thinking suddenly wakes up for them in their own experience and their own concerns and their own projects and so on. This is, what, this is why they keep getting me to come down here. Because apparently this happens, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, this is what happens. And um, to my surprise. So that's why they keep saying, you, you've got to keep coming, you can't not come. So there we are. It, it's, it's good. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's just I can't, I can't sort of believe it. Let me you off. Well, I'm sure we can. Right. Now, of course, I've got almost lunchtime, you'll be glad to know. Um, of course, <coughs> of course, uh, there is a slight difference here if we go back to the plant. The examples we have been giving are really of multiplicity and not genuine diversity. And I've used the term multiplicity and unity. See, each time you get the hologram, or the future plant, or the king of the potato, uh, well, it's the same kind of thing, isn't it? Uh, the, the holograms are, in a certain sense, I identical holograms, identical plants, and so on and that. Now, when we come to the, to the one and the same organ manifesting itself differently, we don't just have multiplicity and unity there, but each of the organs is different. Now, there's a self-difference, because one's a leaf, one's a petal, one's a stamen, and, and so on and that. Um, now, it, but it, I think, without labouring the point, you can see that the same form of intensive thinking is needed here. So what we've been saying applies to that just as well as it does to these more restricted cases we've been dealing with. You can actually find templates for this. <laughs> you can actually find templates for this. Um, one of the ones I like is the duck rabbit, which I'm not going to put upon the screen, the duck rabbit. Because uh, there... You don't have duck and rabbit. There's only one figure, and yet there are two. But there aren't two, because if there were two, you could put them side by side. Say, there's the duck, there's the rabbit. Okay, let's do that. There's the duck, there's the rabbit. But each of those is a duck rabbit. So whatever you do, you can't escape the duck rabbit. And it's a simple multiplicity and unity. Because each one is the whole and the very same one. So the duck and the rabbit are actually the very same figure differently. Now, this kind of image helps us to build up a picture here of self-difference. Rather, because now it's not like the same plant, the same hologram and so on and that. And I actually do love this picture. I've got so much out of this picture in my life. And the people say to me, but you know, yes, but that's just merely subjective, isn't it? Uh, you know, the point is you can use anything that works for you as a template for thinking in a new way. Because <laughs> that's what it's there for. And then we pick up this intensive, because these are intensively nested within each other. They're not extensive at all. So that's really a pretty terrific illustration. Um, now what we can do is we can imagine... Well, there's only two there, there's duck and rabbit. Now, supposing that we could imagine that there was a different figure in which there was more than two. 
Now, I don't know of such a figure, and I don't even know if such a thing can be made. But supposing we could have not just duck and rabbit, but more figures all nested together in the same one, and supposing it went on indefinitely, well, that would be an example of this intensive distinction where there really was self-difference. Now, something like this can actually be done with the hologram. I mean, you don't need this, but there you are. You can actually take the hologram, uh, as a whole hologram, say of a horse, and then you, you rearrange it slightly at a slightly different angle, and you can superimpose on that an entirely different hologram on the very same plate, a hippopotamus. And then you can actually superimpose on that, uh, again, something entirely different, a rhinoceros. And this is the whole hologram. And then, if you look at it in a certain way, when the laser is shone on it, you see a horse. Move your head slightly, and where there was a horse, a hippopotamus appears. Move your head slightly, and where there was a hippopotamus, a rhinoceros appears. And this kind of thing has been produced, and you can do it. You get it with billboards, don't you, when you get this figure, when it changes, that sort of thing. And now, this kind of thing is a bit artificial, and you don't need this. Uh, I must tell you that when I've used this in the past when Margaret Coombe was there she's got very angry with me about this because this is when another bone she wants to pick with me because she says oh, it won't go you can't turn a horse into a rhinoceros or a hippopotamus I said no you can't Margaret that's not the point it's a template for thinking you get the, the movement of thinking from it I know you can't yes it's not Gertian is it you can't do that <laughs> no you can't so don't tell her I mentioned that um, you can't, it doesn't work, you can't turn a horse into a, 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 but it's actually meant to be an illustration of something, not to be taken literally, you know, uh, the hologram and so on and that. Um, <laughs> but you don't really need that, because once you've got the picture from what we've got before with the hologram and the plant, all you need to do is to say, well, when it's self-difference, it's the same form of thinking intensively. Can you cope with that? Are you dead? You're all dead. <laughs> right, well, that's all I'm doing. No, that's all I'm doing this morning, you'll be glad to know. If we could go back now, but I won't bother, to the uh, picture of that organ. And then you can see that that's the diversity metamorphosis. Oh, forget it. We don't need that. Any questions? Yeah, I, um, you mentioned the cellular life earlier, and when, uh, uh, when, when, two, when one cell divides, and then there's two, which was the original cell? And there wasn't an original cell, because it's the one cell dividing in two. Mm -hmm. So then if you rewind time backwards, with, with all of us being cellular beings, and all the cellular life that's on the planet, I mean, obviously you can't know what happened at the beginning of cellular life, but... The implications are the same um, mm -hmm. in the terms of unity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was thinking of something similar in that if you could say that King, what, what was the potato King? King Edward. King Edward. That before it was King Edward potato, it was, you know, a more general. Mm -hmm. And then it was, you know, onwards back in time to the primordial. Potato. Something even before potato. The primordial potato apparently comes from a lake in Peru, like the shores of a lake in Peru. This has been traced genetically. All potatoes come from one place on the earth, and it's actually the shores of a lake in Peru. Mm -hmm. Apparently. That's all potatoes. Well, that's putting the question beginnings, doesn't it? Well, yes, but... Origin. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying before that, before the mm. potato was separate from other plants and before plants were separate from animals, and before. Mm -hmm. I suppose, like, would you look at it as, like, the King Edward potato is just, like, what... Ger was it Goethe that synthesized everything and made it into something, which then when you look back, this is where it began, but actually there was a whole lot before that, but you don't need to go back to that because... So the, the King Edward is like the synthesis of potatoes and then it's a King Edward and it can begin from there because you don't need to go back. Yes, that's the thing. Um, you don't, you're right, 
you don't need to go back. A, a lot of people want to go back, and that's another thing I'll come to that in a moment. But I want to emphasize this, you don't need to go back. Certainly to get the kind of thinking I'm concerned with, the dynamic unity of nature, the dynamic unity, you don't need to go back. But people want to go back. Um, but, you know, going back can be fraught with difficulties. Um, whatever you do, if you're going back biologically, you've got to see that any earlier developments all took place at the, with, with organisms which were barely formed compared to what they are today. They were highly, highly, highly embryonic. You have to get really like, you have to imagine something like the very tip of the vegetative shoot, that that would be what it was like at a much earlier period. Uh, so you can't simply transpose backwards the kind of organisms we have today. And you, you, the, but the important point is remember, you don't need to do this. Now, some people do want to do it, but you don't need to do this. Um, in the Origin of Species, Darwin says something about this, because people misunderstand him, because they say, well, what a fraud. His book's called The Origin of Species, but he doesn't deal with the origin of species. <laughs> well, he does in the way in which he tells you he's going to do it. He says, what I'm concerned with is how new species originate from existing species. And that's what he means by the origin of species, not the ultimate origin of species. And he says, uh, the point is, he says, chemistry manages very well indeed without knowing the origin of matter. And of course, it's completely correct. If you look at the science of chemistry and all that it does, it's terrific. But it doesn't, they don't say, well, we can't do this because we don't know what the origin of matter is. But of course you can do it. And it doesn't matter. Well, it's the same with all these other things. You don't have to go back to the origin. But a lot of people want to, because that, the intellectual mind very much wants to. It wants to jump. Uh, at that conference I talked to you about, if you get crap questions in my head, you really get you, pretty much useless questions unless you get someone who's really good. I was lucky I did get a really good question from someone. Uh, but most of the questions are crap. And one of them was, what did I think Goethe would have said about the Big Bang? Well, you groan inwardly and smile and try pretend you're going to take them seriously while you're actually thinking, you plonker. Um, but anyway, um, you, you say something about that. Um, what can you say? What you can say is, well, you know, he wouldn't have thought about that because he actually restricted himself to things like don't go into questions of origins because you can't. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be that as we get to know more and more and more and more, then you can go closer and closer and closer. But you've got to figure out how far you can get at the point where you are. And he was sensible enough to know that where he was, he couldn't go very far back. Because all you're going to do is put the cheese back into the milk. That's all you're going to do. Um, but in fact, I mean, what I did with that question about the Big Bang was I pointed out that the Big Bang was only one alternative interpretation of these events and there were alternative theories in which this would have to be looked at too. And since Goethe was a very comprehensive thinker, as he was, and he, he mentioned this a lot, he would not simply rest content with one theory, the Big Bang, mm -hmm. but he would look at all the different theories, which of course, and some of them don't involve the Big Bang. As for example, the later work, of, not just the early work, but the later work of, of Hoyle and Nalika, uh, which is very detailed work, and people don't realize this because they go back to the so-called steady state universe in the 1960s. And they don't realize. By the way, Hoyle introduced the term Big Bang as a sort of, as a, uh, meant to be sarcastic. Uh, and it's got adopted as being a description of the thing. But he, he Fred Hoyle introduced the term Big Bang as a, almost as a kind of, they just believe there was some kind of Big Bang dismissively. Um, so you don't have to go back to that. Yeah, but, you know, I'm. Sorry, you, I'm, I've got to ask, yes, yes. Well, first, I just say, I hope this isn't a crap question. <laughs> 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 yeah, I realise I shouldn't have said that when I said it, but too late. But um, I'm really struggling with the, the
So how, I mean, how, do, should I just ignore that for no. now, or how do we reconcile that? No, I mean, could you, what are you saying? What, what I, with the vegetative reproduction, I was talking about clones, wasn't I? Mm -hmm. that, that was a clone, wasn't it? The, mm -hmm. the future plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, and if you get, if you get, uh, no, you're right. You, uh, well, I'll, I'll sort, I will sort of mention this later this afternoon. Um, uh, it, it works the same way. It's just that the, 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 the what I've done so far in talking about this, and this is always a problem, um, I, I, because of the examples I've used to introduce this notion of thinking intensively, we can get stuck on that, um, and we get stuck on the examples. And you're absolutely right then, that in fact um, that produces the same all the time. Um, whereas in the organic world, the, 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 this diversity comes in. Uh, a difference, I'm going to come into that, but the point is that the kind of thinking that's needed for that kind of unity is the same as what we've been doing. It is just that now the amount of difference and diversity becomes real and increases. But ultimately, um, the, if you go to... The, this afternoon I'm going to deal with varieties, phenotypic varieties and genetic varieties. Uh, not really, but I'm going to hint at it, okay? Because I don't know about these things, you do. Um, it, 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 all I'm doing here is I'm only dealing with the form of thinking. Uh, it's a bit too abstract, perhaps, therefore, because it's not going to deal with the detailed nitty-gritty of things. But I'm only dealing with the, the, the form of the one and many, the, the form which the one and the many takes, the idea of the one and many takes, in Goethe's dynamical thinking of the organic. And that would apply in all sorts of situations. But it won't tell you the specific details of each situation. So it won't answer questions about why is there that difference. But it would simply say, well, there is that difference, but this difference is also the unity. Is that, can you, does that make sense? I think it's important to see that if you go back and look at the origin, then that's like a movie that you can play the other way, in a dynamic way. And, and, and see that, that this, um, you're not having a causal explanation of that first potato. It's like a film. It's like a movement which you can then play back the other way and s see that that creative impulse. If you play the movie back the other way, you're seeing the creative impulse that is kind of unbounded. Right. So, so it's not that the potato... Um, is an explanation like the Big Bang but it's a kind of movement that it can reverse that yes yes mm. yes don't try to put into this more than is there I've got to stop because I've got a headache and my brain's gone and I can't I can't I just can't I suddenly it's just blank I just can't focus anymore um, so I don't know about you but I've got to stop <laughs> Yeah, you're going to see me at 3 o'clock, and if I don't turn up, come and wake me up. <laughs> <laughs>